Well, Pete, here we are in July, a uh, nice, hot, warm summer months, but of course, very, very short nights. But uh, there's a few things to see. So let's start off with the inner solar system and Mercury. Well, it's quite low down, isn't it, this, this, this time of the year? It's 15th of July is the best time to catch it. But even then, a very low altitude of just two degrees. Yeah, it's not brilliant. Uh, Mercury tends to be good in May and November. Um, that's when it's sort of around its best but um, as you say it's a it's a morning object rising about an hour before the sun on the 1st of July um, above the northeast horizon it's it's not particularly bright for Mercury at that time about magnitude plus one and um, it's showing a fairly it's actually not a bad size is it for Mercury an eight arc second disc 27 percent lit so a, a crescent Mercury no that, that's uh, that, that'll be quite obvious uh, as well uh, even in a small telescope you'll be able to pick out that phase yeah well on the 8th of July we have a slender three percent lit waning crescent moon 2.9 degrees to the north of Mercury which will have brightened slightly to about magnitude plus 0.2. Um, rising about 80 minutes before the sun, probably from the 8th to the middle of the month, 8th to the 15th, that sort of uh, date range. Um, but throughout the remainder of the month, it heads ever closer to the sun. And uh, at the end of the month, it rises just 25 minutes before sunrise. So that's going to make it pretty tricky to see. It is. And continuing the theme of low down inferior planets, <laughs> Venus, the next planet out, are also suffering uh, very low altitude. Uh, it's actually quite bright. It's shining at magnitude minus 3.9, as Venus does. And it, in July, it's uh, 1st of July, it sets about one and a half hours after the sun. Um, and this uh, figure reducing to 70 minutes after the sun on the 31st of July. But the problem is that at this time of year, when, when Venus is in the sky, it's in the uh, sort of wintry constellations because it's in the constellation of Leo. So it's very low down from, uh, from, from our point of view. The best time to catch it is in the daytime if you can yeah. find the planet in the daytime. What, I mean, what a contrast from last year when it was really, really <laughs> well placed and it was very, uh, very high up. Um, yes. But now it, it's pretty rubbish. The um, I caught it actually in April, and um, the sky was. I know you're going to find this difficult to believe, but it was clear in that direction <laughs> for um, at exactly the right time. So I got I got the binoculars out and uh, tried to find Venus. Got the camera out, took a photograph of the region, and I got it. But blimey, is it difficult to get when it's um, right down low in the bright twilight? It's, um, it is. It's not just a bright twilight, but any any thin cloud as well will uh, mask it and make it even harder to pick up. And getting a contrast against the, the, the sky when it's at low altitude is particularly difficult. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, let's now go to another difficult planet, um, <laughs> the planet Mars. Mars is, is good every 2.1 years. And unfortunately, this isn't one of uh, those times where Mars is good. It's now tiny when you look at it through the eyepiece, less than four arc seconds across, which is pretty small. And it's struggling to keep ahead of the evening twilight. Um, so it's a dim version of its former glory that it was last October, when it was pretty magnificent, actually. Yes, and uh, I got some beautiful views of it with my 12-inch telescope, uh, uh, some really fine detail. But uh, I, I think as, as, as the planet now uh, is, as you say, less than four arc seconds across, visual or imaging is going to be quite difficult to pull out any details and it's getting closer and closer to uh, to conjunction anyway so this really are this really is the uh, the end point of this part of the apparition the end of mars the end of mars it's worth saying though that that uh, it will be joined by venus because uh, venus will pass half a degree to the north of it on the 13th of july and on the 11th and 12th of july um venus and mars which will be slightly further apart will be joined by a thin waxing crescent moon so um that's something worth looking out for it is but let's move out now into the outer solar system and to planets that are going to climb just above the immediate horizon. <laughs> so uh, the planet Jupiter, for example. Jupiter now rises five hours before the sun on the 1st of July and will reach peak altitude of some 25 degrees at about 0350 UT, so 0450 BST in the morning. Uh, but it'll be under a 
a sort of br- bright pre-sunrise sky. Yeah. Um, although it might be low, uh, this is a great improvement on Jupiter's altitude last year. Yes. Uh, where we've seen the planet sort of 14 degrees. And in fact, I only had a very narrow 15, 20 minute window where Jupiter passed between some houses in which to view it. So it'd be nice to have it much higher in the sky this time. Oh, I can't wait for it to start getting even higher. Um, you're never happy with Jupiter's got to be right up um, very high in the sky but um, this this will be a big improvement so it will allow us to actually take advantage of those evenings um, where or nights rather when the seeing becomes stable because uh, you do get them occasionally even at the altitude of about 25 degrees you can still get some good stuff with it um, and it's also worth uh, mentioning as we've mentioned on previous months that Jupiter was at equinox uh, in May and that means that we can see uh, the four largest moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons, undergoing mutual events where their shadows appear to eclipse one another and they can occult each other. And of course, it also gives us an opportunity to see Callisto interacting with Jupiter, so transiting its shadow, falling on Jupiter, and also disappearing into Jupiter's shadow. Yes, and all of that's quite uh, actually quite difficult to capture. Uh, we, we think of the moons of Jupiter, you know, always there, but going around Jupiter fairly fairly rapidly. But Callisto takes quite a long time to orbit Jupiter. Yeah. And uh, because it orbits in the equatorial plane, you don't get to see it crossing the disk of Jupiter all that often. No. So, uh, it, you know, this is, a, this is a good time to get it and its shadow on the, on the disk of Jupiter. And as you say, Pete, passing into the shadows, uh, Jupiter's shadows, it, if you can get that so they are quite rare phenomena and it's worth i think it's worth making an effort to to try and find uh get a clear if it's going to be clear you know getting out and observing it yeah well we'll mention a few of these uh, events later and also don't forget to look in the magazine sky guide because a number of them are mentioned in there every month as well the mutual events carry on until about november i think the last one's in november so we'll bring you a few more of those coming up okay let's pop out then to saturn and saturn is another planet which is dare i say this improving (laughs) it's actually getting higher um, in the sky as it reaches the opposition point um, this year than it was last year it's a tiny difference compared to to jupiter um, but it's still enough to make a, a little difference visually and also if you're into imaging Saturn. It'll take Saturn a bit longer to get up to a reasonable height, but it's it's a positive move, isn't it? It is, but Saturn takes 30 years or so to go around the sun, so it spends a long time in the constant, in each of the constellations. That's great for us when it's in Taurus or Gemini, <laughs> but when it's low down in Sagittarius then it's more of a problem. But as you say, it's in Capricorn and about 18 degrees altitude uh, when it reaches its highest point. So that's pretty good. And the rings are still nicely widely tilted open, although we will be seeing now more of the southern hemisphere um, as Saturn starts to climb higher. So the rings will start to close up until we move towards the next ring plane crossing. Well, that, that's a few years down the line. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, out to the ice giants then, Uranus and Neptune. They're sort of slowly crawling away from the sun. But Uranus is not very well positioned at the moment. It does manage to reach an altitude of 22 degrees above the eastern horizon under dark sky conditions, um, as seen from the centre of the UK by the end of the month. Neptune favours a bit better, actually, um, because it can be seen under dark sky conditions towards the end of the month, although it can't quite get to the position due south when it will be at its highest. Um, But it'll be sort of as we crawl into the the latter part of summer and into autumn that Uranus and Neptune are actually at their best. Yes. Well, okay then, Pete. We have another of interesting specials uh, this month. All month, of course, we are now in not to lose some cloud season. So uh, typically if they're present, they're going to be seen 90 to 120 minutes after sunset, low above the northwestern horizon or at about a similar time before sunrise, but then on the northeastern horizon. And on the 5th of the month, Earth is at its furthest point from the sun. Uh, This occurs at 2237 UT. And this is said 
to be at a, Earth is said to be at aphelion, and it will lie at its furthest point from the sun. Do you remember the actual distance? The actual distance is one hundred and fifty-two million one hundred thousand five hundred and twenty-seven kilometers. If I remember correctly, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you haven't got it written down in front of you at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Aphelion, of course, it's um, it's an important... Well, actually, it's quite interesting, um, Aphelion, because if you're into solar observing and you look at the sun through a certified filter, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the disk size of the sun is at its minimum for the year. And that actually make, it makes a big difference for me because I do um, some calcium K imaging of the sun using uh, my... Uh, PST, Personal Solar Telescope, I've got a calcium K version of that. And um, it's very difficult to fit the sun onto my imaging chip in one go, unless it's close to a phelion. And then it just shrinks enough so it fits perfectly. That's interesting. So you have a sort of a, a physical measure there of uh, a t the tiny difference it makes when we're furthest away from the sun. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, let's um, carry on then. So on the 6th, um, or the morning of the 6th, I should say, a 13% lit waning crescent moon lies 5.8 degrees south of the Pleiades open cluster. Oh, um, so you'll see, the, you'll see the moon rising about two and a half hours before sunrise. That's about um, 0220 BST, 0120 UT. And on the morning of the 9th, if you take a look at Jupiter through the telescope, you will see Io and Europa are really quite close together. In fact, they're separated by just three arc seconds, which is roughly the apparent diameter of the planet Uranus. And this occurs at 0143 UT. And possible, a very thin moon may be seen rising above the northeastern horizon one hour prior to sunrise. A phase less than 1% lit. So that's another one of your thin crescents. Pete to, to try and watch out for. Yeah, and interestingly, that carries on into the next day because on the evening of the 10th, there's an opportunity to catch a very thin waxing crescent moon above the northwest horizon, the moon setting an hour after the sun. That's going to be a tricky one. Yeah. On the 12th, uh, Callisto's shadow is in transit from 2148 UT to 0232 UT, and Jupiter will rise shortly after the transit starts. But that's quite rare, as we yes. said earlier, yeah. given the geometry of the of the Callisto-Jupiter system. Getting a, a, tr a transit of, of Callisto's shadow is quite rare. So whether you're visual or imaging, any, everyone should try and get a, a look at that. Yeah, definitely. Well, we come back to our own moon again on the evening of the 16th because uh, the 44% lit waxing crescent moon will be showing the popular Claire Obscure effects on that evening which produce what are known as the lunar X and V and uh, that produces those two letters appearing to hang just in the dark part of the terminator um, and they're probably at their peak appearance about 2150 UT. And on the 17th, uh, Ganymede, the largest satellite of the planet Jupiter, Ganymede's shadow will be in transit from 2240 UT until 0217. Um, Ganymede itself will start to transit from 0253 BST or 0153 UT. And that's, again, quite an interesting one. Not only is the shadow uh, quite large on, on Jupiter, but, Gan but Ganymede as well appears to be quite large as it transits uh, yes, transits it Jupiter. And quite dark as well, I've noticed. A number of, I've got a, seen a number of Ganymede transits. They're quite... Uh, Ganymede itself, particularly when it's against the brighter zones uh, of Jupiter's atmosphere, looks very, very dark. Yeah, like Ganymede and Callisto are quite straightforward to see where they're in transit the other two are not so easy are they no europa in particular if that's going against the equatorial zone um, and there's no coloration in the equatorial zone it can be very difficult to pick out yeah okay well we've got a comet well there are always lots of comets up there but mm -hmm. comet 4p fay um, is worth mentioning on the 19th of july because it will be shining around magnitude well 13th magnitude um, and it'll be one degree north of uranus which is at magnitude plus 
5.8 so that's visible in the morning sky so that's worth having a go for it's a bit unusual it is also, i think it'd be quite tough though won't it because the comet will be quite diffuse and spread out or has it got quite a bright core it could be quite a tricky one to 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 pull out uh in the morning sky i haven't looked at fave for a very long time so um yeah i, I think a case of going out and having a look but yes. uranus is a good a good uh, marker for it at that yes. time so if you can locate uranus then you should be able to see the comet um and then on the 25th we've got another ganymede shadow event with ganymede shadow transiting jupiter's disc from 0244 ut and on the 28th we have the peak of the delta aquarid meteor shower so this isn't a very very active shower it has a maximum zhr of 16 meteors an hour but it can still produce some very nice meteors um we do have the moon around unfortunately it uh, uh, rises at around 2230 ut and it'll be 74% lit waning gibbous. So it will, it will uh, you know, get in the way and only the brightest meteors uh, will be visible. Ah, oh, but there's a, there's a saying, isn't there? If the moon is there for the Delta Aquarids, it's not there for the Perseids. That is you the say saying, this is, is you say it's a saying. I've only, I've only ever heard you say it. So I don't know no, in what way it's, it's still a saying. saying. Um, well, it's, so, how is it a saying if only one person says it? <laughs> yeah. All but, right. But, 29th. 29th, we have another Jupiter uh, event. So, again, if you look through a telescope uh, just after it rises, so Jupiter will be quite low down. But you will see two moons and a moon shadow in transit. And these are the moons of Callisto and Io, the shadow belonging to Io. And Io's uh, shadow exits the transit at 2223 UT. And uh, Callisto uh, will be 0130. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's quite nice to, to look out for. I don't think I've got a drawing or an observation of Io and Callisto on the disk at the same time. No, that'll, that's that's even rarer than uh, Callisto doing its, <laughs> its thing. Um, and then finally, we should mention Saturn, of course, because Saturn is at opposition next month, and now its rings should be starting to brighten um, as we enter the period known as the opposition effect. Um, so make an observation of Saturn around the end of July and then follow it through to opposition, which I think is the 2nd of August, isn't it, if I remember correctly? Yes. So that's... That will um, that will you see the rings getting brighter and brighter, and then they'll fade after opposition. Right. Well, let's move out to the stars because although we have short summer short summer night skies, there's still lots of very very splendid things up there to see. So if it's clear, uh, it's best to go out and have a look. Uh, Really, after any time after 11 o'clock in the evening, it should be starting to get fairly dark there. And you'll find that the July night sky is filled with all sorts of spectacular local deep sky objects. In other words, they're situated in the nearby part of the Milky Way galaxy, which is high in the summer sky. Yeah, the Milky Way is really worth seeing if you've got opportunity to um, get out somewhere dark. And of course, hopefully fingers crossed with everything that's been going on recently all the restrictions will be uh, lifted on us and we'll be able to get out into the countryside if you have means to do that and have a look up at the night sky on a clear evening and it is breathtaking to see the milky way i mean people you know will spend vast fortunes to go and see sites around the world etc but this is on your your doorstep basically uh, you've just got to get away from artificial light yeah, it's actually quite interesting, you know. You don't have to go to a really, really dark sky just to see the Milky Way. Um, if you're dark adapted and, you know, you've not got any security lights around you in your garden, it actually can stand out really rather well, even from a town or city. But if you move away into, you know, 10, 15 minutes drive into the countryside uh, and look up where there's very little light pollution, it really is... Stunning. Yes. I think it almost has a three-dimensional view to it. It almost, especially when you've got the dust lanes there, you, it does start to look three-dimensional. Oh, it's breathtaking, and it's quite ironic that the brightest part of the Milky Way is the part which is in the direction of the core, which is in the constellation of Sagittarius, the Archer. Um, but from the UK, that's really low down, so the atmosphere attenuates the view of the Milky Way. Um, close to the atmosphere so the core doesn't look as impressive as, as it should do 
The most impressive part we get is the bit which runs down through the so-called Summer Triangle. That's the triangle formed by those three bright stars, Vega, Deneb and Altair. Um, and it's the, the part which actually runs down through the northern cross of Cygnus, isn't it? That's the bit where the brightest yes. part of the Milky Way is from, from the UK. Yes, and you can see that the, there are various dust lanes in, in that part of the spiral arm of the galaxy, and uh, as they pass through Cygnus, that's a, a good constellation to try and catch them. And it is, as you say, Pete, quite a, quite a stunning sight. Um, if, you, if you're sure you found Vega, then a nice thing to do, a nice object nearby, is the star Epsilon Lyrae. And if you've got good eyesight, it'll look like a, a double star, but if you have a telescope then you'll see that this isn't just a double star, it's a double-double. And uh, the separation of the two pairs is actually quite small. It's only 2.8 arc seconds and 2.2 arc seconds. So unlike planets or the moon, where if the seeing's a bit off, you can't use high magnification, that isn't the case for deep sky or stellar objects. You can use quite high magnification on them. And so you should see if your telescope can split the two, two up. You should be able to do that. Well, it's also a good test of your telescope optics to see whether they're aligned properly and and, um, how good your telescope is because uh, they are quite close together um, it's also men worth mentioning that between the two bottom stars of the squash diamond that sits to the south of Vega is the wonderful object uh, M57 the ring nebula and it's um, it's slightly offset to um, the star to the west and slightly south of the line that joins those two stars together. Um, it's often said it's midway between them, but it's not. It is slightly offset, in the, as I've described. And it's a very easy thing to overlook and think it's just a star if you use low magnification. So the trick is to sort of look at the field, look at the one which looks a bit iffy, and then pile on the power. And if you've got the right thing, that'll be the ring nebula. You see this disk with a small telescope, but with a larger telescope, you'll see that there is a darker region inside this disk, and that's the the sort of hole, if you like, in the centre, which makes it look like a ring. Yes, because this is the ring nebula, and this is the final remains of a star which has come to the end of its life, a star the same sort of size as the sun, and it sheds off its outer layer into space, and all that's left is uh, the, the core of the star, and this is a, a, a splendid example of uh, a planetary nebulae. And one day, the sun will look like the ring nebula in someone else's sky. Not from Earth, but from a planet around a star thousands of light years away, the, the sun will become like a little ring nebula be in a, billions of years' time. A popular time. thing to photograph, no doubt. Um, It'll be cloudy, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we mentioned the Northern Cross already, and um, that pattern is quite large. That's the sort of core of Cygnus the swan but at the foot of the northern cross which is literally the head of um, the swan is that beautiful star beta cygni albaria which is a beautiful double it's one which i think if you're if you're a seasoned um, observer of the skies you tend to overlook it because you think oh yeah i've seen that before but just make the effort to go back and have a look at it again because it is breathtaking, isn't it? It is. I have a what I tend to do because my observer sessions are quite organised in that you know I've got to get the planets and my variable stars. But what I these days I do is I just before packing up, I actually now spend a good, last 20, 25 minutes just having a look and re-familiarising myself with some of these old favourites. And I think I probably, last summer, spent a lot of time looking at Albiro, just because it's such a beautiful object to look at. Yeah. And as you say, if you're experienced, you, you have a list of targets you want to go for, and some of these wonderful things that probably you got, got started in astronomy, these were the first things you looked at, you should make the time to reacquaint yourself with them if you haven't had a look at them in a while. Yes, I think because they are easy to see and easy to find, you tend to over look them but yeah they are worth going back to and another example is um, Messier 27 the Dumbbell Nebula which is a, a beautiful planetary nebula it's um, it looks completely different to M57 in that it's larger and it's brighter um, and it's got a different shape and it's just um, it's fantastic to to look for it is. It's a. The, this is the dumbbell nebula, and it kind of looks like an eaten apple core, doesn't it? Uh, to, <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of describing it. It's in the constellation of Vulpecula, the fox, um, 
which is not the best known <laughs> constellation <laughs> ever. It's it's quite odd when you look at it on star charts because it's just three faint stars with two lines joining them. So it's like a, a bent line, if you like. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's quite uh, interesting. But between um, Volpecula and uh, well, actually quite close to the bottom of the Northern Cross, I think is probably a better way to describe it. There is a, a little cluster of stars. And if you've got binoculars and you scan around here, you might be able to find it. Um, this is called Brocky's Cluster or the Coat Hanger Cluster. Um, and it's qu- quite a beautiful sight because it looks like a coat hanger. Yeah, it's it's quite pretty. Um I I have seen it once or twice and uh you, it's one of those co- it is one of those objects in astronomy that actually looks bears some resemblance to what it's been named after. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. And um okay, well we could end then with another thing which looks exactly what it's it's <laughs> named after, which of course is the teapot asterism in Sagittarius the archer, because it looks exactly like a teapot. I can remember having conversations with um, Sir Patrick about this, and he just could not see that shape. He could not identify it as a teapot. I don't know whether he's being awkward or what, but he just he just could not see it. I can't see the teapot. No, I, don't, I, I can see the teapot. It does look like uh, a, a, a teapot shape. And uh, it's worth saying, isn't it, that uh, once you've found the teapot, the spout should come into view. And if you look around this region, there's lots of uh, little clusters and interesting objects yeah. just around this part of the sky. So get outside if you've got dark skies, especially if the moon's not about, and just enjoy the view. Um, it's it's quite a, an amazing time of year. As the sky's getting darker, it'll really sort of get you, drag you back into astronomy. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Pete. <laughs>